Somebody knew what I was going to preach today. I did let a few of you know. And so that was a wonderful hymn to introduce the subject. And I appreciate you picking it. Even down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And when hoary hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born. That's the essence of what we're going to talk about today. From Isaiah 46, you can turn there with me. I was reading through this passage several months ago in my devotions and was encouraged by it and thought there might be some encouragement in here for God's people in Catskill. My own parents are aging and they have a lot of trials that come with aging, a lot of pain, different kinds of chronic illness that is making life difficult. They're both believers, I thank God for that. They live next door to us, I'm thankful for that as well. And there are many others in our congregation that fit that bill, that are going through the graying years. And I preached this to them and the sermon has made its way to other places as well in terms of encouragement to God's people. Um, another application came out of this passage that I can't ignore, and that is to the unconverted. So we're going to have something for you this morning, if you know not the Lord Jesus Christ, something for you to consider and to meditate on, and I pray would bring you to repentance and faith, that you would walk through life remembering your Creator in your youth and have Him with you in old age as well. And the Lord keeps reminding me of myself how applicable this is to me. I think I read yesterday, the day before in Numbers, about the Levitical priesthood and their service was from the age of 30 to 50. And in 10 days I will be entering my 50th year. And I thought, wow, if I was a priest in those days, I'd be entering my last year of service in the tabernacle. And what does that mean? Retirement's biblical? I don't know. Early retirement's biblical, maybe. But one thing it definitely means is I'm not getting any younger. And uh, some things able to do wouldn't be able to do in my 51st year. So I do pray that the Lord would bring encouragement to those of you who may fit that bill with me and that the Lord would bless you. So let's read Isaiah 46, verse 1 down to verse 5. Bell has bowed down. Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. They stooped over, they have bowed down together, they could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, you who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you. And I will bear you. And I will deliver you. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike. Well, let's pray again. Lord, we ask for help and grace. This is your word, it's not ours. We're handling words that you have given to us and we want to understand them. We want to be blessed by them, encouraged by them, challenged and sanctified through them. And yes, Lord, under the word that you have given, saved, converted to Christ, brought to the place where we repent and believe and look to him, as our only hope of salvation. Father, there are many things happening in our world that should cause us to think of our mortality, that should cause us to consider whether we're right with you. 
May today be an encouragement to be right with you. May today, through your power and grace, be a day of salvation to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, we ask for this help and pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look a little bit at the context and then the contrast in the passage that is being made, then the comfort will bring some applications home at the end. But the context of the passage here, I want to give a little background on Isaiah. First of all, he was a prophet of Judah. And you read this right in verse 1 of Isaiah's uh, book. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, down to Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So that was the particular realm of his ministry as opposed to a prophet to the north or Israel. Haley says his ministry probably took place between 745 and 695 B.C. During his lifetime, he witnessed the destruction and ruin of the northern kingdom at the hands of the Assyrian armies. There were two waves of Assyrian advance into northern Israel around 734 and 721, resulting in their ruin. A few years later, Israel's gone. The Assyrians came back and advanced through 46 walled cities of Judah, taking 200,000 people into captivity. The Assyrians came to Jerusalem around 701. And with Isaiah's encouragement to pray through Hezekiah, the Lord crushed the Assyrian army, we know that account in the Old Testament, and delivered the city miraculously. And by his own outstretched arm, he delivered them. Isaiah preached and ministered during a point in history that was spiritually dark in Judah. God had begun to judge them for their sin. And judgment is never easy. Haley in his handbook further says Isaiah, his whole life was spent under the shadow of threatening, of a threatening Assyrian power, and he himself witnessed the ruin of the entire nation at their hands, except only Jerusalem, end quote. Tradition says that Isaiah was killed by King Manasseh, Maybe he's the one that was sawn into, spoken of in Hebrews 11, as tradition uh, seems to point us toward. Indeed, he no doubt was a man of whom this world was not worthy. Isaiah, secondly, is called the Messianic prophet. Many of you know this. The New Testament authors quote Isaiah more than any other Old Testament book. John 12, 41 says Isaiah saw the glory of Christ and spoke of him. In my own Bible reading that same week back in August, I came across, again, the passage in Isaiah 43, 23, to, every, to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. That was in 45.23, I'm sorry for that misreference. This is the passage Paul quotes in Philippians 2.12. Paul's divinely inspired commentary and use of Isaiah 45.23 teaches us that this verse is about the reign and rule of Jesus Christ being recognized one day, brothers and sisters, by every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're still waiting for that day. Isaiah saw Messiah and visions of Messiah's first coming, and he saw visions of his second coming as well. When all of the world, whether they like it or not, will bow and confess publicly that Jesus is Lord. That's going to happen. As we view world events, that's encouraging, isn't it? That one day all the enemies of Christ will be put under his feet. And all of the wicked people and wicked dictators and leaders of nations will be made to bow before King Jesus. Isaiah got to see amazing things. And it's no wonder he's called the Messianic prophet. When you read Isaiah 53... 
you not only get a feel that Isaiah was there at the foot of the cross, but the amazing thing about Isaiah 53 is I don't really believe we have a better passage in all of Scripture that explains the theological significance of the cross. As if he was seeing Jesus being pierced through, being crucified in our place, before that form of execution even existed, the Holy Spirit is whispering in Isaiah's ear exactly what's happening behind the scenes, that it's not simply men piercing Jesus the man, but God is striking down his son in the place of sinners. That we can be saved. The theology of the cross, nowhere clearer in all of Scripture than through Isaiah 53, hundreds of years before Jesus came into the world. He was given an amazing understanding into things unseen, wonderful and beautiful things that we worship the Lord for. In the chapters leading up to Isaiah 46, God is declaring, as you read them, his uniqueness and how incomparable he is to anything men would call God. One of the distinctions was that God, unlike anyone else or any other God, one of the things that makes him God, uniquely God, is that God alone knows the end from the beginning. He's not subject to time. He's above time. And in fact, he's the God who has decreed everything that will happen in time. And it is all working according to his good purpose, counsel, and plan. He knows the end as if it was history, as if it was the beginning. This is one of the things he's revealing about himself. He's encouraging his people to keep in mind. He's challenging the gods of the nations with this attribute, that he knows the future, that he can do things men cannot do, and certainly their false gods which they have created cannot do. Places like 45, 20 through 22 in Isaiah. Gather yourselves and come. Draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. One of the distinctions about our God, and one of the important reasons I wanted to look at this context a bit, this timing in history when Isaiah preached and prophesied and spoke the words we're about to consider. In the beginning of Isaiah 46, God through Isaiah predicts the destruction and ruin of Babylon and their gods, Bel and Nebo. This is an amazing thing. Because Babylon is not even an empire during Isaiah's ministry. The boundary of that nation has not begun in history and in time. They do not exist. The world power that's in charge, that's taking over the world, is Assyria. Babylon would come later. And yet Isaiah is predicting the destruction of Babylon before it exists and the destruction of their gods that don't exist yet either. The Babylonian captivity of Judah would not happen for another hundred years. And the Medes would not conquer Babylon for another 150 years after Isaiah's prediction. The Assyrians still in control. Babylon doesn't exist. The Median Empire that would conquer Babylon does not exist. And yet Isaiah speaks about these nations as if he was recounting history. Now, what's the explanation? Well, Adam, well, Mr. Davies, there must be two or three Isaiahs. One that wrote Isaiah 
after Babylon took Israel away. You know the kinds of people who give us these kinds of, of errors that are actually out there. Google, how many Isaiahs were there? Maybe not. Don't tell your pastors I told you to do that. But there's errors concerning that. Because how could it just be one Isaiah that could talk about a nation who didn't exist and gods that didn't exist? Well, hello. He serves the God who knows the end from the beginning. This is the prophet who not only did that, but explains theologically the significance of the death of Jesus on the cross. A form of execution that didn't even exist. Oh, by the way, by an empire, the Roman Empire, which would exist many more hundreds of years after Babylon and the Medes existed. Because that's our God, brethren. He knows the end from the beginning. And if you believe that, you won't entertain these lies that there are more than one Isaiah. There's one Isaiah who's speaking and preaching on behalf of the God who knows all things. All things past, all things present are open and laid bare before him. That's an amazing being. That's an amazing God that we serve. All praise be unto him. Not only does he speak about the Medes, Persians, King Cyrus, who would allow Israel to go back to Jerusalem. He speaks of him, the particular individual, who would allow Israel to return to Israel from Babylon after they were taken captive. 44.28, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundations will be laid. Now, you can see why preachers just appear to be nuts and crazy. I mean, <laughs> Isaiah is preaching to those who live in Judah. And he's preaching in a time when the temple still existed. It was still there. What do you mean the temple's foundations need to be laid? When Isaiah was preaching, there was nothing wrong with the temple. The Babylons hadn't come in and destroyed it yet. And yet he prophesies of a time when the shepherd of God, Cyrus, leader of the Medes, we would find out later in history, would allow Israel to go back and build the temple again. Nehemiah and Ezra. A temple that in Isaiah's day was still standing. Isaiah is either absolutely crazy to his countrymen or he's 100% true. And we know from history that he was true. God was true. Let every man be called a liar. Cyrus isn't born. The temple's not going to be destroyed for another hundred years. Cyrus's nation won't be around for another hundred years. He would be the king of the Medes and Persians and would serve as God's shepherd, God's servant, to bring back his sheep to Israel, back to their land. Well, let's look secondly at the contrast, having considered the context in 46 through 1 through 5. The passage is all about contrast. Verse 5 points this out. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? And we know the answer to that. There is no comparison, but that's what the passage is about. He says through Isaiah, let's talk about the gods of the nations and see how they compare to me. Better yet, here in 46, he says, let's talk about the gods of nations not yet worshipped by a nation that doesn't yet exist. Let's do that. I'm going to tell you the names of gods that aren't even created yet. Let's compare them to me. You see how foolish it is to worship false idols and man-made religion. There's only one God. There's only one way to God. And his name is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
That's how Jesus describes heaven. It's where the Father is. Salvation and the blessing of salvation is all about this relationship, being reconciled to the Father. It's not simply about going to a better place. If that place doesn't have God in it, it ain't better. Jesus says, you know how you get to heaven? You get to the Father by me. One way. This is the scandal of the cross that we preach and that we believe, but it's absolutely true. Turn from all dead idols and false religions to the true and living God. Here God is mocking gods who don't even exist yet. By a nation that's not even on the world stage yet. Let's talk about them. Let's compare them. It's an amazing thing. He mocks the gods that existed and worshipped by the nations in Isaiah's day, but those also that would be worshipped during the lives of his great-grandchildren by a nation not yet existing. And the fate of those gods will be the fate of all gods and of every person that has existed or ever will. To me, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. Ultimately, all of history is moving towards the point when it won't just be believers believing this, but all people will know this and publicly declare it. Probably more importantly, publicly declare it. Because men know there's one true and living God exists, even though they won't admit it one day they'll be forced publicly to recognize it. The idols of Babylon are described here in verse 1. That's what's happening. It's kind of a weird chapter to jump right into. Bel has bowed down. Nebo stoops over. What is he saying? Well, these are the idols of Babylon. And he says they're brought down and they're placed by men on the backs of beasts and cattle. What does that mean? Well, in the ancient world, the conquering nation... After taking that nation out and that nation's army out, would take the idols, go into the temples of those nations, remove the idols, and replace them with their own. And these idols, often made from precious metals, would be brought back as spoil and as a sign of ultimate victory. Perhaps a warning to other nations that they and their gods are no match for us, the idols of the nations can't walk for themselves. But here God's mocking them. They must be carried by beasts. God says to idolaters, the things that you carry are burdensome here in the passage. A load for the weary beast. The things that men worship must be carried by men. And in this case, animals. And God is, in, in essence, indirectly comparing animals that he has made to the gods these people worship. Animals have more created value than your gods, who are powerless, speechless, and, and lifeless, and can't even walk with their own two feet. It's a picture of utter humiliation. And God here is showing how contemptible and foolish it is to serve idols, to the neglect of the true and living God. The four-footed animals and cattle can walk, and therefore they can do more than your gods. The big idea is that the idols of men must be carried by men because they are lifeless, they're powerless, and they are therefore useless. Verse 2, the idols can't save each other. Perhaps that's what's being explained here. Together, Nebo and Bel have fallen. What of their worshipers? They can't save each other, these gods. And what of their worshipers? And here, think with me how demoralizing this must have been if you were Babylon or a conquered nation in the ancient world. And you're being brought captive to another nation. And as you're walking demoralized, defeated, broken, not knowing what to expect, not knowing if you'll even live another day, next to you there's an animal carrying something on it. 
something rather large. Maybe there's two oxen that are carrying this load. And you notice the animals are, are not liking it. Like, this is really heavy. And then as you walk, you know, the animals jog a little bit. And maybe a, a cloth that was put over this, this thing that they're carrying reveals that, oh, it's the god Nebo that they used to worship in the temple. Think about what that must have been like if you were a true believer in the ancient world. You look over and there's your God. Just like you. Demoralized, laying prostrate, being carried by an animal. And in one instance you realize what a fool you were to put your faith in that. And to think that that could deliver you from the army that came against you. Think about the utter loss. Spiritually, you must feel in that situation. Everything you're living for wasn't worth it. And didn't save you in the end. And was useless to you in the hour of greatest need. Or or maybe you could picture... And maybe that's what's happening here. The worshipers are still, for some reason, have respect for these gods. And as the soldiers and beasts are carrying these idols of theirs, maybe some of them even dare say to the Babylonians, Oh, Mr. Soldier, could you please take a different route so that the idol won't move around so much and maybe even fall off onto the ground. It's a picture of worshipers pleading for the salvation of their gods. But to no avail. Your worshipers couldn't even save you. What good were they? They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. The gods with the peoples who believed in them and who served them it's sad isn't it it's funny in some ways but very sad to think of people who have faith okay but faith in the wrong thing it's not just important to be people of faith it's not just important to sincerely believe as long as it's something well you could sincerely believe in the wrong thing Be exceedingly religious and devoted. And end up suffering utter loss and ruin in the end. Like this church exists to tell people they don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that now. And you don't have to anticipate a future wondering, when I appear before God, am I going to be okay? If Jesus Christ comes back this afternoon, am I ready? You don't have to live your life wondering that. You can actually be prepared. You can actually put your faith, all of it, into one basket and have the peace that passes understanding by the presence of the Holy Spirit assuring you that that is the right person to believe in. His name is Jesus Christ. This church exists to point people away from dead, useless idols to something of substance, to something of significance, to someone who actually can save. Jesus Christ. He saves sinners who don't deserve to be saved. He saved me who doesn't deserve to be saved. And if he could save me, and if he could save the pastors of your church, if he could save the members of this church, this church is here to tell you today, you can be saved too. And you don't have to suffer like these idolaters did. Because, you know, idolatry exists today. Like, you're not worshiping maybe a, a wooden idol, a little Buddha or whatever it is. It's in your house. But if you love something more than God, guess what? That's your bell and that's your Nebo. That's the idol of your heart. 
What do you love more than the Lord? Is it a sin? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Is it money? What is it? That's the name of your idol. If you're living for that and you think in that you're going to have more joy and more happiness and a future because of that thing, you're completely wrong if it's not God. That's your idol. This is you. Maybe someday. We don't want this to be you. Before we even get to verses 3 and 5, we're able to see the utter ridiculousness of worshiping false gods, the sadness of it. Gods who aren't God at all, who can't save, can't even do anything for themselves, let alone others, can't do what the animals can do. Your dog can do more than your gods in terms of saving you. Bel and Ebo, the great gods of a great superpower, an empire, They were brought down and could do nothing about it. And here's the point. Your gods need to be saved and carried and protected. And gods who need their worshipers to save, carry them, and protect them are no gods at all. You can see the comparison, the contrast between false gods And the things that God promises to do for his people in the passage, right? Like, I don't need to be carried. I carry you. I have carried you. And I will carry you. I will bear you up. What an encouragement. What a blessed contrast. And that brings us to the comfort of the passage. This is what God says to his people. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. He's speaking to the believing remnant, who are God's true people, to encourage them to trust and to believe. He's about to show them another way. He's about to remind them how wholly distinct from the dumb idols of the nations he is. He not only truly loves his people, but is amazingly faithful and able to support and bless his people from the cradle to the grave. Consider my dealings with you in history. You have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Remember Israel, your history. Remember your past and the history of this country how you even came to be a nation. Think about it. Look back. Remember it. He describes his relationship in this passage to his people in terms of the relationship of a pregnant woman and a caring mother. I have borne you, carried you in my womb when you were vulnerable and being created and put together and knit together and fashioned in the womb. And we can understand the imagery of of the nation of Israel. God calls the nation from one man, Abram. Abram has some children, they have some children. Then all of those people end up going where? To develop into a nation, they go to Egypt. Egypt was the greatest empire in that time of the world's history. And within that great wall of an empire, Israel was being fashioned in the womb of Egypt, protected because they were guarded over by the pharaohs and by the greatest nation with the greatest army on earth. And it's there within Egypt for 400 years that the couple of dozen people who went in to Egypt Come out of it a nation of millions, perhaps. 400 years in the womb. God was growing them and blessing them. And and they were growing so rapidly that Egypt began to get concerned. And we know the history. He carries them out of Egypt, right? How did Israel escape slavery and bondage 
in Egypt. They had no weapons. They had no money. It's amazing those passages you read, that account of God giving favor in the eyes of their neighbors to essentially give the Israelites, their neighbors, all their gold and all their wealth. How does that happen? God moved the hearts of the people around Egypt to basically give up all their wealth to the Israelites. How does that work? God is able to get down into the soul of an individual and convince them to do something that's utterly ridiculous and utterly to their disadvantage, but to the advantage of God's people. Isn't that amazing, brethren? So now they got money. Well, how do they come out? Did they rise up in rebellion and have a, an, an, an Israeli revolution against Egypt and take them down by force? No, you know what? The Israelites did, they sat back and they watched the salvation of the Lord. Plague after plague after plague. God brings upon Pharaoh. God brings upon the land. Until finally Pharaoh says, please go. Leave. And they leave and then he has a change of heart. No, no, no. With his army he goes out to destroy the Israelites. Well, is it then that they rise up in rebellion and turn their plowshares and their, their forks into swords and spears and slay the Egyptians by their own hand? Oh no. God parts the sea, brings the Israelites through on dry ground. The Egyptians follow and boom! All gone! The whole army destroyed by who? God Himself. I mean, these people that talk about the Old Testament as a works-based religion, like you had to do this and that to be saved by God, it are crazy. Because Israel, Israel came out of Egypt, and no one could deny that salvation from beginning to end is of the Lord. Amen. He starts even before the commandments are given, just to remind his people the place of the commandments, not, they're not unimportant, but they certainly weren't given so that people could save themselves. I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. See, I saved you, and now as a saved individual, here's my law for your life. Sounds like what he does for us, too. Saves us while we were yet enemies makes us children of God before we even know what happened to us. We have this new love for God's law and God himself. And we want to know his law and he graciously gives it. And we follow it, not to be saved, but because he has saved so wondrously, so beautifully. Consider your history and my dealings with you. I carried you. You see the imagery. You know, women, mothers who love their kids. I mean, you're taking care of that baby before it even is birth. The prenatal vitamins, the what you're eating, what you're not eating. You realize that, kids? Your mother was taking care of you before you even were born by how she took care of herself because you were delicate, you were vulnerable. This is the picture. God's people are always vulnerable. And we need to be provided for and protected. And this is the beautiful imagery. You know how you, you know, Jack, Pastor Buckley went to see his grand, grandson, right? Daughter. Daughter, I'm sorry. And I'm sure when he went to hold this grandchild and his daughter gave her to him, he didn't just grab it like a football and start running across the room. He gently took the baby put it in his arms, certainly Mrs. Buckley, and just rocked. And the way you hold the baby carefully, the way you carry a baby, and the way you, you, you speak to it, all of that, even that little child that has a soul, grace and peace and strength and stability and I got you is all communicated to that little newborn and they just go to sleep. And they got not a care in the world. And this is the imagery that God uses to describe the way he carried us. 
He saved us. He provides for us. He's gentle with us. He's compassionate. You know, he, he doesn't just rough us around. What does it say in Psalm 103 about God? He knows our frame. He remembers we're but dust. He knows that psychologically and spiritually, it doesn't take much to rock the boat. We are literally our own worst enemy. The way we think and meditate and some of the roads, our brain goes down and it doesn't take long before we get really scared. We get really stressed. We get really anxious. Anybody relate to that? But God loves us and he knows we're like that. And so he gives us the word like this. Remember how I've dealt with you. My child, remember that. I'm not going to stop dealing with you. Like a loving mother does her child. In other places in the scripture, he says, look, really, I mean, it, it's a comparison. But like all comparisons with God, they break down, right? Even if a mother forgets her own nursing baby. I mean, we can't fathom that happening, but God says it could. Even if that happened, I, unlike her, will never forget you. Our names are literally tatted to the palms of God, inscribed. That's the language of Scripture. I don't know about you, but if I had something inscribed on my palm, probably would always see it pretty easily and readily working with my hands. I mean, these are the things God uses, this, this, this human language to try to get us to, to be at peace and to know that it, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. That's what he's doing here. It's beautiful language, isn't it? I mean, beautiful imagery that God's given to us as a gift to read and to meditate on, to remember. When we get scared, when we feel vulnerable. Now I'm telling you, as you age, you begin to feel more vulnerable. Think about my poor father, riddled and racked with pain. He's essentially a shut-in. Sleeps 16 hours a day, can barely move, he's in so much arthritic pain. And different diseases that he's had, scoliosis, he's bent over so that his lungs can't get enough oxygen, now he's on oxygen. Which we have to remind him to keep on. Can't breathe without this, Dad. But he's so vulnerable and weak. I saw a picture the other day when we got married and... He looked so different, like he was this big guy. Overweight, okay, yes, but big guy. Now he's shrunken down 135 pounds. I just, you feel that. You know what's happening to you as you age. And you enter a whole nother level of temptation, of challenge, of fear, and of anxiety, and of worry. How am I going to provide for myself? Who's going to care about me? Who's going to take care of me? God is coming to you, saint, and saying, I'm here. I've been with you from birth, and I'm going to be with you right now in these difficult years. And keep in mind, I mean, these, these people were living under the threat of invasion. Like these poor Ukrainians. And we see it on TV. Grandmothers on the ground taking up AK-47s, learning how to defend themselves. I mean, they are living under the threat of no longer being. And what that must feel like. That's what these people were living under. And I'll tell you, the women and children are not immune, and the elderly are not immune when a nation like Russia is doing what it's doing right now. They're the most vulnerable. They're the ones that are going to go first. This is where they were living, these Israelites of old. Consider my promise for your future, verse 4. I've sort of jumped to it already. Even to your old age, God is assuring them, I will be the same 
and even to your graying years. I will bear you. I have done it or made you, he's saying here, and I will carry you, and I will bear you. And he's repeating again and again, and I will deliver you. God does not raise us and carry us from being babies. Now here we could think of this spiritually, being spiritually born again. He doesn't carry us from the beginning of our faith, only to let us go when we come of age. We're described in this passage as beings that are eternally dependent and needy. We're not a people that need God when little, but not really when we're old. When we become mature in the faith. The maturest Christian in this church, new believer, young believer, still needs God as much as you do. And guess what? Believers who've died and gone to be With Jesus in heaven, they still need God just as much as you do. We'll be eternally dependent on the great God from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. To him be the glory forever. In fact, the older we get, the more often we feel our need of him more acutely. And here, in that experience, God says, I've carried you, am carrying you, and I am committed to carrying you, providing, caring, until you're old and gray. I'm not a God like the others that needs to be carried. I am the God and only God of heaven and earth who carries his people. The manner of God's care, we already spoke about it, He describes the way he carries us in terms of this loving mom carefully and lovingly carrying her newborn. He carries us in a manner that's loving and reassuring. This is the blessing of walking with God. That he is a God who's able, because he's spirit, he's able to spiritually communicate peace and strength to the souls of people, to the heart and soul of who you really are. What you are is not what you appear to be physically and outwardly. Just because you're big and tough doesn't mean you're like that on the inside and you know it to be true. You could be a big, tough, macho person, muscles bulging out every part of your body, and in your heart and in your soul be like a little child that cries all the time. And God is able to come to the soul of people, communicate peace, when really, outwardly speaking, we should have no peace, right? Like, why should I be at peace? I'm in the graying years. I can't do what I once did. I'm dependent on my kids. They were dependent on me. That ain't right. That's okay. That's why you had kids in part. So you could depend on them. Just as they did upon you. That's what family's all about. God uses families to communicate that. Thank God I got my parents living with me and I can take care of them and help them. Just as they did for me. That's the duty of sons and daughters. And as you get older, you need to be open to that. And God will do it that way. But, you know, we're going through these years and we get depressed even thinking about it. But God, even in those years, can give that strength of soul. It's all good. I don't have to worry. For some reason, I'm at peace. God's got me. Like, can you relate to this? Now, let me ask you. I mean, how much would you pay to have that? Like, is that valuable? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, money, it has value. But, you know, there ain't no more Biden checks coming. It's all gone. Right? But God never leaves. He never comes and goes. We have him eternally with us, walking with us, spiritually communicating power and peace and blessing that it's going to be okay. The God who's with me is going to continue to be with me. The unchangeableness of his care certainly is emphasized 
here, even to your old age, into the graying years, I'm not going to stop being with you and supplying and supporting you and helping you. This is the point of the passage that warmed my heart. Led me to want to preach it in Catskill and out here. You know, it's not just the physical difficulties, the mental loss that we suffer, but let's face it, we're getting closer to the river of Jordan. We're getting closer into the valley of the shadow of death, like the shadow is upon some of us in the graying years. Now, I understand none of us knows the day of our death, and that could happen to you in the prime of life. But as you get older, like, it's, it doesn't, you know, it's getting closer. And that can be difficult. And God's assuring us that even up until death and in the experience of death, I'm going to be with you. One of the most beautiful descriptions of this is Pilgrim's Progress. Yes, it's hard and difficult, but you just get this sense that God is with Pilgrim and his friend all through the process and they end up into the celestial city and the experience was made bearable because of God's presence and this is a blessing for us to know that as we grow older yes we do less for God some older saints may struggle with this what am I doing for the kingdom what can I do now there's a lot that you can do but even in that feeling you need to understand this God never does less for you though you can't do as much as you want for him I made you. I'll carry you. Get this emblazoned into your soul, indelibly etched into your meditation, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He leads us and carries us unto the end. And as we close, believer, don't ever forget that God is true to his word. Listen to his word. And the challenge of God. And do not ever think he is like the gods of this world that are impotent and unloving. To whom will you compare me, make me equal, that we should be alike? We should also be like God as his people, shouldn't we? We should aspire to be like him. And not look at the aged among us, our own family members, our in-laws, even them, the elderly in our church as burdens. But if God is like this toward the elderly, this is a mark of being a Christian. We will aspire to take notice of them, to help them, to check in on them, to make time for them, to visit them. One of the greatest things you can do for an elderly person, saint or non-saint, is to simply make time in your schedule to call them and visit them. And all of us can do that. And as God's people, we need to be like God and aspire to help carry these aging brothers and sisters and to rise up and call them blessed and to honor the gray-haired among us not treat them as our politicians do. People should be in jail who occupied seats of power in New York government for what they did to the elderly during COVID. Or better yet, what they didn't do and was in their power to do. And how dare these people write books to profit off of how great their so-called leadership was during COVID, when thousands among the elderly lost their lives because of his poor decisions. Brethren, let's not be like that. One of the things that I need to get on the stick about is getting back into the nursing homes we used to minister to. You know, COVID's the excuse for everything. Well, I'm sorry, we got to stand up and be humans again. And as ministries get back into the nursing homes, because who knows what's happening to these people, and they need your visit, and they need your presence. They need your support in that way. And we can do it. You get the picture. We need to be like God. Caring for the unborn, right? 
like God and for those who are in these vulnerable stages of life. And then, unbeliever, I have to close by encouraging you, if you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you're serving another God, a God who in the end will leave you in utter despair. And I want to imagine yourself at the end of time when the Lord Jesus comes back. And I want you to think of these people here. Who it was too late for them. They were destroyed and taken to enemy territory. They had put all their faith and confidence in false idols and false gods. And things they shouldn't have loved more than the Lord Jesus. And they lost everything. Irreparably. They would never get it back or ever have hope of salvation again. That's what it's going to be like for people when the Lord Jesus comes. There's a picture, I think it's in Isaiah, of the idols that men are holding on to. And it's a picture of them literally losing heart to even hold on to them and realizing these were nothing. He is everything. And now I am lost forever with no hope of ever being saved. And if you don't think that's going to happen, read Proverbs 1, who speaks particularly about people who attend church and who hear the gospel and who are pleaded with to repent and believe in Jesus. Please do so before it's too late. By men like myself, who seem crazy sometimes when we're up here. Because we're pleading for you to repent and believe. We don't want to see you go to hell. And you had that again and again and again. Proverbs 1 tells us, and you paid no attention and you didn't believe. And you thought there'd be another day when you could believe and be saved. And then that day is over. And you know what to do and you know who to call on and you try to. But it's over and there's no hope and no one's listening. Don't wait for that. Here's another picture of that in Isaiah. Don't be like these fools. That we pity. That our hearts break over. Be saved. Today is the day of salvation. I got life today. I might not have it tomorrow. I can think today. I can pray today. You may not have that tomorrow. The world is an unstable place. Has the events happening in Ukraine, have they woken any of you up? Seven days, the situation is completely different. You just don't know what a day is going to bring forth. Today you have life. Today you have breath. Today you can be saved. All you got to do is repent and believe in Christ. Don't wait another minute. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. And part of that means you will not be disappointed. <laughs> You're not going to lose anything. But you stand to gain everything. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the gospel. That we can be right with you today. Because of what he has done. Because of what you have done, O oh, Heavenly Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Oh, we pray. Get a name here among all who don't know you yet. Save them from their sin. We thank you, Lord, for your promises to the saints. Once again, another blessing, another reason why we as your people will never be disappointed. These assurances, these promises of your presence with us, of your willingness to carry us in old age. Oh, may it sink down into our souls and may we be given peace even today, no matter what our physical, mental circumstances no matter what pressures and things are weighing upon us lord take it all and carry us to glory thank you for these good things encourage these dear people save the lost be glorified through it all in jesus name amen, amen.